Fedor, the great Fedor is making some news. It had to, Big John and Daniel Cormier are to be thanked for having a back and forth on this. And now I'm jumping in. So Fedor's going to get a little bit more headlines, which was this. Daniel Cormier had talked about Fedor in his prime. Fedor is known as, as the greatest heavyweight of all time, but that gets a little bit confusing, right? Are you saying that his skills are better than any other heavyweights? Because that's what it's supposed to mean. Or are you saying that he did better than any heavyweight of all time? Because one is a debate and one's really not. In this particular situation, there's really not a resume to compare with Fedor. Fedor was at 1.31 and 1. The one loss that he had came via TKO because he got a cut and the ref stopped it. They rematched and Fedor smoked a guy. Was smoking him and would have smoked him the night that he got the cut, in all fairness. But that's a piece of the story, right? You hear people do that with John Jones. People that say, well, John is undefeated. Well, he's not. He's got a loss. And you go, well, yeah, but if you knew about that loss, right? It's one of those things. But every now and then, gosh, it kind of is relevant. And the loss that John had, he was in absolute control of the fight. They disqualified him for cheating. And with Fedor, he was subject and he had a cut and the referee made a decision which he has the authority, but it certainly wasn't a reflection of the athletic contest taking place. I give you that explanation because if we do throw it out and we look at Fedor at 31 and one in main event spots against the top guys in the world that could be gotten, gathered and offered, it's remarkable. Daniel Cormier said if Fedor was in the UFC, he would have been average. So Big John stepped in pushed back on that. And then Daniel came over the top of that and said, you know what, John, you're actually right. I withdraw the statement. And let me tell you how it would really be. Okay. Because when you talk about the guys that were ahead of their time, and then you look at the guys of today that are all where that guy was. So you then try to classify him and go, well, he would have been just one of the boys, just another phase, average, as was used in this case. If Fedor was to have 10 fights, Back in that day, where he did have advancements, technically, understanding the fundamentals, if he was to have 10 fights back then that he absolutely dominated, he never lost a round, and you were to take him with today's UFC fighters, first off, he would have had six fights, not 10. He would not have been able to do the 10. He would have been, it would have been tired, would have needed longer break, was, would have taken a lot more damage. So he would have done about half as many fights in that time, and the fights would have been closer. Fedor still would have won. He would not have been average. Fedor was ahead of the times. He was a very good wrestler. He was a very good submission artist, but he will knock you out on the feet in lightning speed. And above everything else is Fedor could push a pace that had never been done at heavyweight. I'm not positive it's ever been done since. Daniel Cormier himself was very good at weaponizing pace. Daniel called it the grind. But Daniel was going to be in that fight nonstop. Fedor had a little, the same thing, but with a little bit more sprint at times. And in any weight class, if you can weaponize pace in any sport, you can go to the highest levels. Using pace as a weapon, creating fatigue as a way of making a coward out of any man, was made fashionable in sport in the Munich Olympic Games of 1972 by a man named Dan Gable. Dan was right. Coach Gable, I should refer, was right. And other guys are doing that, but Fedor had one of these incredible paces. Now, the guys that he would have been in there with were going to be very ahead of the guys that he was in there on a regular basis with. Japan and Pride did things. I mean, they would they would bring somebody in that was a foot taller than Fedor. You, I can see him in my head. You guys can too. I just can't produce his name for you. And he's got 60 pounds on Fedor. And one point they put him in there with a guy that had 100 pounds on him. But then they also put him in there with Mirko Krokop and Big Nog, and Mirko again, and Big Nog again. Mark Hunt seems to come to mind. I mean, Fedor was in there with some real rough guys, but where he could accumulate 10 fights because of the way they were scheduled and books and the skills of those opponents, I fully admit to you, he could not have cranked out all 10. And as wide as the gap was that he experienced, it would have been closer. I won't concede that guys have passed him up. I won't. And there's times within this sport where we, we see a guy who is clearly better at the sport. He gets it. He gets more positions. He gets more strategies. 
he understood Frank Shamrock comes to mind. Frank simply knew more about the sport. BJ Penn comes to mind. You guys remember Dennis Holman? I was working out on a daily basis with Randy Couture and Dan Henderson. Now, only wrestling at that point. They had done some fights. I had done a fight, but we were just wrestling together. We were just getting into MMA. And the gym was just starting to grow. And all of a sudden, the Abu Dhabi champion, Jeff Munson, is now part of our workout. Then all of a sudden, Jeff Munson brings this young man named Dennis Hallman up. They lived by each other. It was a three and a half hour drive. Jeff wanted some company. Dennis wanted to work out. He brings him in. I remember going home that day and telling my father, the greatest fighter I have ever met, I met today. His name is Dennis Hallman. And Dennis would run through us. Like it was nothing, 155 pounds, like it was nothing, one after the next. He could stay in and we could rotate. He was so far ahead at the positions and the understanding of the sports of setting you up, of tricking and trapping and finishing you. He was so far ahead. It's the future Pride two-time champion, the future UFC two-time champion, the current Abu Dhabi champion. That's how far Dennis Holman was. It was just one of those things. Now, I bring that to you just by example because we will see some guys, and I feel as though Fedor is getting painted with that same brush. And while you will have a guy who can get caught up on, whose skills can be ahead, but they simply catch up, I will admit for you, guys are a lot closer. The guys are a lot better. Some of those guys Fedor fought sucked, but not all of them. And even the ones that didn't suck, it was very dominant. And it wasn't dominant just because of that right hand. And it wasn't just dominant because of the ground and pound. It was dominant because of a pace and a pressure. And that's what makes the greats. You cannot call a guy who had a pace and a pressure of Fedor Emelianenko average. You can't do it. And Daniel would agree with me. He's going to have to hear me say this first and then go, Daniel, what do you think? And he's going to go, Chael, you're right. Over no time anywhere in sport of combat, if you had a guy who could put a pressure on you for as long and burn you as hot as Fedor would, in no sport ever, in any weight class, would that guy qualify as average? He'd have had less fights. He'd have had more decisions. They would have been closer. He would have burned some more calories. He would have beaded a few more drops of sweat. He still would have beat them all.